and welcome to episode 325 of the Crate and Crowbar, a PC gaming podcast recorded on the 28th of May, 2020. I'm Marsh Davis, and I'm joined by the words, rasping groans, and wet grunting sounds of Alex Wiltshire. Hello. And by extra special guest, a voice from the distant, distant past and a distant, distant continent, our man in Japan, Richard McCormick. And the distant, distant future. Hello from the future. It hey. is the future there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Has it been a nice day? Uh, it's been very hot. It's been too hot because it's decided that it's now summer. Japan doesn't really do spring so much anymore. It kind of does winter, 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 and then, oh, turn the air conditioning on. <laughs> <laughs> so is it humid now as, as well, or is it a dry heat? Well, it, the benefit of not being allowed outside is that you can just put the air conditioning on. So it's 21, and it's been 21 since, I think, about mid-March. <laughs> What's the Atmos like, despite you not being able to go outside? Uh, well, everyone can go outside and nobody really stopped at any point over here. <laughs> uh, so strange because all the news is coming from, you know, English speaking countries where where people aren't allowed outside, but also kind of strange. Well, you should tell outside. that to people on Moreland Road. I went down there today to buy some groceries out of necessity. Everybody's out. Nobody's wearing face masks. People coughing happily into the fish stalls. <laughs> crazy it's the cough shop open again yeah yeah (laughs) yeah hey so rich what are you what are you doing out in japan uh i am currently working for a a small indie studio called 17 bit who Mm. uh made galaxy before and then they made skulls of the shogun prior to that uh and i am doing things secret things (laughs) skulls of the shogun is a good game and galaxy is a nice game as well yeah. I think you should announce what their new game is right here and now. Yeah, why not? Who said a new, who said a new game? I just said something. <laughs> I suppose you could all just be furloughed. Yeah, just that's, twiddling that's your a, thumbs. There's a lot of plants to water and some fish to feed. So someone's got to do it. <laughs> well, talking of, of uh, new things that can be announced, mm-hmm. uh, there was a... I'm not quite sure what this is exactly. Wholesome Games, formerly... what. Uh, Rich tells me was a Twitter account uh, appears to be doing a sort of mini E3 but for games which fit their definition of wholesome small generally indie games of a certain aesthetic and emotional tone that would probably not otherwise get the same level of exposure have been grouped together and they put out a video much like uh, you know the Xbox showcase but specifically for games of these kinds Called the wholesome direct yeah. um and it's 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 quite interesting i was wondering so i had some reservations about it because i feel like while it's a cool idea in general to find different ways of grouping together games that might otherwise suffer from j- just a, a lack of visibility finding some way to bring them all together and put them out as one single sort of showcase is a really good idea i do wonder if bringing games together on the basis of maybe a shared aesthetic, maybe a shared emotional tone, m- risks making them look homogenous and probably trivializes their differences in some way. So but... I, I thought the same thing, but then I started thinking, well, uh, like most E, you know, E3 uh, presentations are also homogenous and one yeah. tone because they're mostly men shooting each other. And I sort of thinking, ah, is this me thinking what a game should be? Like, is that is that what's going on? Because I definitely felt the same watching it and thinking, ah, these games are kind of molding together into one cute kind of mass and mm. uh, and my cynicism is not being done well by them. Yeah, I think... I, I think they missed the trick in some ways as well, not calling it colon three, like the cute face as its name. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's definitely, I think, I think after an E3 or after like a, a Gamescom, you do, you end up with, a, as Alex says, kind of a similar feeling of, wow, I've been buffeted by just a lot of fairly similar things. And yeah, granted, there is more kind of, kind of freedom and leeway in what you can have on these bigger stages. But yeah, I find it hard to kind of really break down what has actually been seen and yeah Mm. comparing it especially to i mean microsoft's own xbox one of these they did and watching the wholesome one 
they both feel about as slick as each other. I mean, obviously, everybody's trying to to navigate this this brave new future we live in, where everybody's got to put as many books behind them on video calls as possible. <laughs> so people looked, yeah, fairly fairly natural on camera, and they got in and out of it fairly quickly and showed showed some stuff. There was, you know, you left with an abundance of uh, pastel pastel shades, <laughs> lots of pastel, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you're oh, right. That it was it was much more slick. I think it comes from having people who are maybe closer to the creative side actually produce these things, whereas, you know, E3 and and uh, Microsoft's uh, big exposés are always filtered through multiple layers of executives and uh, and PR people who may actually not really understand what is interesting to the viewership. Um, whereas these people presumably started the Twitter account from a a, a position of I wouldn't say exactly fandom, but you know, obviously intense interest in the games that they're talking about. They kind of know <laughs> what people want to hear and see. Yeah. But actually, uh, so I, I don't know. It's it's quite a it's quite a long showcase, about thirty minutes, and um, it does it does end up diversifying quite a lot towards the end. And I think they made a mistake of maybe uh, top loading the first ten minutes with games that all looked quite superficially similar even down to the the cartoon aesthetic that each individual game had chosen and the shading model that they had chosen for the games it's quite a lot to compare between them but then the further you get through it there's there's much more kind of varied art styles there's uh a, a really lovely looking game called bird alone i'm not quite sure what you do in it uh mm. but you seem to be planting flowers for the pleasure of a parrot um there's a game called Unpacking, which is a sort of isometric game where you just unpack boxes, presumably in some sort of therapeutic way. As, uh, there's lots of birds in, in this trailer. There's well, a game where you play a kiwi, and there's another game where you play a skateboarding bird. Skateboard does look great. I've been keeping my eyes on that as an inveterate Tony Hawk's fan. Like anything with, <laughs> with skateboard is good, but skate, <laughs> skateboard plus bird. But I guess it's bird specific. Well, he is a skateboard plus bird, isn't he? Yeah, bird specifically <laughs> definitely got uh, the door kicked down by Goose Game. Like I feel like everyone was just waiting <laughs> to do their bird game and then Goose Game came along and <laughs> everybody's doing it. Yeah. I think it's also funny that kind of outside of that community, like that sort of, um, you know, that, that Twitter account and, and the community that's going around it, like what on earth is a wholesome game? I mean, you know, like the wider, the wider um, showcase, kind of does express a, a, a wide kind of gap but like wholesome is a very um subjective uh amorphous sort of word which you can fit lots of things into i was quite i mean i you know i started to think oh so wholesome the word wholesome is just sort of like uh unassuming and uh unthreatening is that what it means but then kind of as you're going through and I said to amend it like oh okay wholesome is also the kinds of games that are about relaxation and about kind of organizing without being pressured and and then oh they're more expressive forms of wholesomeness like the I, I, was, you know, I, was, I was just interested to sort of feel the word wholesome being kind of explored in this showcase which actually I mm. rather enjoyed yeah, I liked it as well. I, there's one thing, though. I mean, as, aside from it, the way that these, um, there is a sort of, a, there's a lot of variety in the showcase, but there is, there, it returns to a particular aesthetic crutch um, time and again, which is which is fine. It happens to be a, an art style I like, but there's also like um, a tonal style to writing, which I've seen a mm. lot in games, which just seems to be sort of like the cruising altitude of, of semi-humorous, non-threatening games. It's sort of this like casual uh, adolescent Americana sort of tone <laughs> where, you know, it's... It, um, hey, it's buddy. Nice game where you, hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah. And you, you you walk up to a toad who's wearing kicks and yeah, the toad says, butterflies suck, man. Butterflies are the worst. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's fine because it's kind of funny to see anthropomorphized animals talking in a kind of glib uh adolescent you know patois but um it kind of wears off and i've seen so many games using it now and so it's I... also not really a, a kind of language that speaks to me it doesn't speak to any part of my youth or experience and it doesn't really seem to have much to say apart from that kind of initial juxtaposition of you know a, a character talking to you in this kind of really 
glib in formal way. I think you're right because I I've moaned about it during um so when we talked about a short hike um yeah months, yeah it's definitely ago, in that. I really grumbled about the um the voice that that's used in that which is the precisely the same one which I I was at the time I was kind of feeling a bit guilty about leveling it at a short hike because short a short hike is such an overwhelmingly charming and like wonderful game. But you know, I did find that tone. It didn't doesn't speak to me for the same reasons. You know, mm. and um, and you know, I've always been very suspicious of the concept of, like, uh, you know, this sort of one culture, um, that that sort of that the internet is particularly accelerating, and that one culture is, it's American. You know, it's it's American youth, um, of like of a kind of quite a sort of um, uh, uh. uh rich you know a well-off kind of um youth of kind it doesn't of... exist anymore is this this isn't presumably how the youth talk today i feel like this is like an imagined 90s oh, sure. uh childhood so yeah, I mean, rad they... and stuff yeah they mentioned that in the like quite early on i can't remember which game it was now but quite early on in the in the wholesome games uh, presentation like they say that it is it's kind of a 90s kid thing and it's this yeah, I guess wholesome does have a whole lot of meanings, as we've already discussed. But nostalgia seems to be a pretty heavy one, and the idea mm. of you know you you are nostalgic for this past. But I, I mean, for me, while I didn't have that kind of endless summer like um, you know American kind of childhood, you do have that. There's enough media out there that that kind of confirms this for you. This confirmation bias you get of like, well, I saw enough TV shows showing it that I feel like it almost was my shared experience in some ways. You can yeah. see why people lean into into that as as the idea of it being wholesome equaling nostalgia, wholesome equaling some kind of imagined, remembered past where yeah. it was always sunny. You'd always be on your bikes going out to find dead bodies in the woods, and then you have to get off some train tracks. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think also this isn't. It's definitely not wholesome, but the uh, uh, the Stranger Things uh, and uh, Simon Stalinhag's art, all this this is like desperately trying to get back to this sort of eighties thing, which is hugely popular now with people who did not live <laughs> at all during the eighties. I, I I wonder. I'd like I'd like to speak to the kids, the <laughs> Ertines, and know what it is about this past which they find uh, attractive and compelling but i don't think um, they're, they're the, like the people who are making this and presumably also buying it like i think they're more people in their 20s aren't they yeah but i mean that's that they are also people who didn't live through it yeah no, i agree i agree <laughs> yeah. i just who did yeah. live through it <laughs> i mean i yeah the, the question again of wholesome like the the second game they say i, I think i went in with preconceptions of wholesome being you know like un unoffensive and, and cute essentially being what it meant and it was like the second one is you're an orphan and the world is ending and you've got to live out your final days and it's like oh that's not, <laughs> that's not cute it's quite hard i thought the other thing about it was um like the overwhelming nintendosity like so there's i talked about a little last um in the last part i think um about this uh, visual language of um nintendo dialogue um prompts where the words you need to care about are um, highlighted in some way. Like mm -hmm. in, in Zelda, there'll be the place you need to go or the thing you need to collect. Um, and and like that's used like almost sort of by every single game, like, you know, in this sort of genre and this kind of s s sort of area. And Animal Crossing does, has a lot to kind of answer for with the burbles as well, you know, replacing, replacing text. I mean, from the localization side, it makes life a lot easier when you're not actually doing the, uh, you're mm -hmm. not having to localize any of the burbles, but i can understand there's another video uh that came out this week of interest um it was a retrospective on the life and works of arcane studios as presented by no clip and uh danny danny o'dwyer yeah yeah he seems like a nice man he is uh, <laughs> I can tell. uh yeah it was it was a really interesting documentary there's lots of lots of good information there on uh the 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 rise of the studio the the times when it wasn't making anything are perhaps the most interesting because there's very little visibility obviously on cancelled projects and um 
they were very open about uh, everything and they were willing to expose their triumphs and their failures in equal measure, it seemed, which is quite unusual. It's quite a turnaround from the uh, from the famous phrase uttered from the studio heads previously, I guess. Yes, yeah. Press sneak fucks. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's that us. Awesome. They finally yeah. snuck in to get the real scoop. <laughs> yeah. But in this in this video, they also uh, show off several games that were cancelled, um, including The Crossing, which I believe you did a Edge cover feature on, Alex. Way yeah. Back that was, like I have a weird sort of sort of like uh, history with them because yeah, that was that was my first ever article for Edge. I was waiting mm. before I joined them, and before we joined them. But also, yeah, it was my first kind of game industry game kind of media article. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, like that was, uh, so I, yeah, I talked to, um, Victor Antonoff, um, Raf Colantonio, I think it was just those two, like I hadn't seen the game. I just saw a few screenshots, like in a, in some, and some art beforehand chatting to them on, over the phone, um, wrote this article for like, you know, not really, you know, knowing edge, you know, wanting, desperately wanting to write for edge and stuff, but um not having done it before it was this weird completely unknown experience so i was writing about something i'd never seen before or kind of done anything with with people i didn't hadn't ever heard of before really um and it went out and um and then the game just never came out <laughs> like, mm. how many games have you cursed uh in this way Alex? <laughs> quite a few now i think rich stanton's got the biggest count among Somebody us count. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's the famous like, Madden curse. The idea that any any of the uh, NFL players that go on the cover of Madden next year will always break their legs or something. Oh, well, <laughs> done that with but what what I found um like so the the with the the no clip vi um video, that was the first time I've ever seen the the cross the crossing running, and like that looks like a good game. Like I'm a bit mm. I was slightly you know the 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 gunplay stuff. I thought uh eh. But the first person melee stuff and the the movement and things of the Templar classes. So the, the crossing, just to explain, um, was going to be a multiplayer game in which uh, you'd have two sides going at each other. There was a sort of one side from a conventional real world kind of military sort of SWAT style fighting normal guns and things. But then the other side, um, that faction were Templars and they were... Basically, they moved around a lot like you do in Dishonored. So they have a blade, a, some kind of proto blink move. So it's sort of a short teleport. Um, there's a grapple, a wall running. Like, uh, and from what I could see in the first person views of playing someone playing that class, like the view of seeing your hand with a blade in it and the way that it would move around and some of the sort of kinesthetics of, of, of that first person experience were very very dishonesty like yeah it was really interesting did you have the um the same kind of thing with the like leaping forward and jumping kind of slightly supernaturally or was it much more grounded a little bit yeah there was a there was a scene where there was a bit where the where the player just jumps into uh some of the military players and kind of just assassinates them from having been hiding in a kind of a, a like an area above and that was mm. that was really really dishonesty there was a sort of yeah an unrealism to the the distance dropped and that kind of thing yeah i mean the key feature was that it was a, a single player game in which you could uh, sort of open yourself up to having mm. enemy characters possessed by real people that's essentially. right yeah um, I mean, it, it did. It looks incredibly polished for something that didn't make it to production. Like it looks like it's a long way along, um, uh, and they go through the reasons uh, why it didn't quite make it to uh, market, which are, sound horrible and traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then they also show off um, LMNO, which was um, did we did we we never put that on the cover, never did, did we? Because we would we would harangue people. All the time. So at the time, uh, Randy Smith, who was working on LMNO, was doing a column for us. And like, mm. we would just badger him all the time. Come on, when can we do it? When can we do it? And like, you know, EA would be going, oh, no, 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 no. I couldn't, you know, couldn't get anywhere with that. Randy, you know, he would have talked if he could. And yeah. like, uh, yeah, this was what uh, Steven Spielberg collaboration yeah. in which you had uh, an alien sidekick. Um, 
or rather you are rescuing an alien from some sort of is it meant to be nevada or is it just nevada-esque it's meant, place that's meant to be nevada. they said that it was a, like a, a coast-to-coast journey so yeah that right. and the bit that set in is, is explicitly nevada but at that, that time, having like an expressive AI companion was was uh, fairly unheard of. I don't know if that predates. Does that predate Half Life Two? No, it's afterwards. It's, not, no. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, that that uh, yeah, that never made it. That did not come about. You can see. I mean, that with that one, I can see that that is an incredibly uh, challenging game to make, yes. especially yeah. for the time. Like that was. Um, you know, just all of the issues with getting a, an interesting AI and th- interesting things to do. Spielberg um, had refused any um, gunplay, although it did have punching and stuff. Like it did have violence, but he wouldn't allow guns in it. So that so kind of seemed incredibly it. violent yeah. for uh, something which wasn't lethal, supposedly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and for those, yeah, like I think, you know, you're meant to be able to walk around with the AI and interact, you know, give the AI items and it would react to them and, it would kind of animate up, you know, walk to where you were going, even if you're on top of a building. And they were talking in the video about how that had to feel totally kind of believable, incredible, look good, and like, yeah, really hard. It seems to be in their DNA. I haven't actually watched the video yet. I've been saving it for the weekend, but like, they they seem to bite off genres that are uniformly considered to be fairly difficult. Like asymmetric multiplayer has never really kind of taken off in the same way that people wanted it to. First person combat, like melee combat, is I mean, Dark Messiah did it probably better than almost anybody else, but it's famously difficult to do that. And then you've got kind of first person stealth is tricky, historically tricky, mm. but they managed to kind of get that right with Dishonored as well. Yeah. So it seems to be in the, the studio's kind of profile just to bite off these, which maybe explains all the cancellations as well. But yeah. yeah. Well, the other, the other big cancellation is uh, their Half Life 2 spin off game, uh, Ravenholm, uh, which also looks like it was quite a long way along when it was canned um and to my surprise like any any game following half-life 2 would have to come up with something equal or more interesting than the gravity gun and although the thing that they come up with in this is a sort of uh, electric electricity device it is actually pretty it, it looks like it would be a lot of fun to play with i can imagine they could have squeezed out quite a lot of variety from it i love the um, um the, like these being able to uh shoot circuits into the wall with um na- yeah. a nail gun oh, that was fucking cool yeah yeah dead now though yeah <laughs> That I've, what was really fascinating about that one, like it was absolutely um, a Half-Life game, you know, in the way that it looked, you know, obviously the way it looked because it was running in stores and with their, with those kind of assets, but it was, it was, it was a Half-Life game through and through, but it was also uh, pulled out all of the immersive simminess out of, um, of, of, of Half-Life um, in the way that, you know, there would be, you know, uh, the sort of being able to set traps for enemies by by laying these electrical circuits kind of across and then attracting a bunch of zombies towards it. There was, you know, Arcane managed to do all the Arcane stuff, <laughs> like, you know, that had been set up by Dark Messiah and Arx Vitalis and, and all that stuff, you know. It was all, I love the way that through all of the games, whether they came out or not, there's this through line of one particular kind of game they were trying to make that was established right from the start with, yeah, with Arx Fatalis. Like, I like studios like that, where just mm. sort of, they're just endlessly returning to the same thing and just getting better and exploring another facet of it every time. It's quite different to, I mean, Valve and Half-Life. The Half-Life, you know, the at least one and two, and most of the episodes are this kind of constant road movie where you're everything you're moving on. Ravenholm's kind of still obviously hugely widely regarded today, but it, it, it's really just a vignette in the middle of the game. It's not, it, it's very evocative, which is why it's stuck in people's heads and gave you these toys to play with. But I, I do wonder how, you know, obviously again, we won't say it because it's dead, but like the setting a game completely in one space, whereas Half-Life has always kind of chopped and changed how that would have felt and arcane again the dna being much more here is your play space do what you will with it versus half-life which is come on we're gonna show you the next thing next thing come on come on move on get in the car get in the boat keep moving Mm. yeah yeah that's it yeah anyway very cool documentary there's loads of excellent anecdotes in it um as well about uh prey to some extent and uh dishonored uh good moustaches very good in it as well 
Yeah, excellent. There's a, a very nice Frenchman who's so sweet in his enthusiasm for, for the for the canned Half Life game. Feel for him, man. Feel for him. <laughs> Prey was good though, wasn't it? That was a really good game. I, I want to play. I, I, ever since watching it, I've wanted to go back to it. Have you been playing anything good this week, Rich? So actually, that's a nice little segue. Uh, I've been playing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice. Uh, I've been playing Observation which uh, has a lot of stuff in common with with Prey in terms of, um, I don't want to spoil too much, uh, in terms of being in space on a space station (laughs) with some stuff um, that (laughs) that is maybe not all it seems to be when you first get there. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's just come out on Steam, so I actually kind of run through it properly. I beat it all in one sitting last night. It took me about, I think, like three or four hours maybe a bit more uh it's got a real singular sense of place uh i feel like i realized when i finished it it was it was quite late when i finished it last night and i'd I'd been checking behind me every like 10 minutes because my my pc faces the wall and the doors behind me and i realized that my neck was sore because i just kept turning around and it's it's kind of there are some spooky bits in it but it's just it creates this pervasive sense of dread uh constantly all the way through it and i I can't remember many games except for like alien isolation and weirdly like the gone homes of the world the thing that you you know you're left in the world with and you kind of feel very alone but maybe they're a bit less deliberate than this like it really nailed that sense of tone um it felt like you are so not not to spoil too much not to kind of go too deep into it but you you are the ai uh on a space station in low orbit around Earth, and you, as the AI, kind of wake up with someone else in front of you, and most of your memory's been wiped, and you don't know what's going on, but you rapidly ascertain that something's going on, and something's not quite normal. But you don't really know what it is, uh, but as the AI, you don't really have the kind of the same, oh, what's happening here, kind of abilities that you would have where you were a flesh and blood person. So you kind of got to pick your way through it. It's mostly just puzzles. Uh, and it's mostly kind of very awkward puzzles, to be honest. Like the, the sense of tone and the sense of place and the sense of dread are maintained really well through, and they very much know the the kind of the aesthetic they want to go for, which is somewhere between uh, not Annihilation, the other one, Arrival, between Arrival and um, uh, the other Netflix movie that was similar, but was about a space station that ends up doing something again not too many spoilers but one of them <laughs> arrival obviously was very high budget and then the netflix one was, was quite low budget and i think observation kind of pitches itself somewhere between the two and falls largely close to where it aims i think in terms of story but yeah there's there's some i know much you've been playing it as well and other people have played it on the pod before and there is a lot of awkwardness in the way that it's it's the story they want to tell that you are picking your way through rather than there being any kind of like ability to obviously you know set your own narrative and make branching choices is a bit of a reach in this kind of game but i like at the beginning you go in and you play uh this ai and you get the opportunity to the woman who's on the station with you kind of does a voice recognition sample with you it's the first thing you do in the game and you can choose to accept or reject it and you know you can kind of buy into this idea of being this characterful ai that that even though it says you should you know accept or reject it actually according to your own firmware you could say actually no i'm gonna i'm gonna reject it because i'm gonna be malevolent or i'm gonna be cheeky or i'm just gonna be pretend to be stupid you know you're role playing this ai and you kind of get excited because these choices could unfurl in front of you but then pretty rapidly you realize that now you just kind of have to pick your way through the story that has laid out in front of you And, and if you make that in inverted commas wrong choice the game will just kind of not even gently steer you back it will just kind of nod you back on track and push you push you through there's there's one bit quite quite late that i definitely won't spoil that is there's they manufacture a sense of urgency and it, it's like a very gamey element where you're just like well there is no urgency i know there is no urgency because because nothing's happening and there should be something happening here in order for me to, to want to do this quickly and the puzzles themselves also have that sense of like awkwardness is interesting design question that you get in things like resident evil where the controls are wonky uh 
and it's a question of whether that is deliberate to make you feel claustrophobic and tense and, and that you don't have all your faculties, which makes sense if you're an AI because you're all you exist as in the game is like a floaty Wheatley style sphere that can kind of puff its way around zero G or some cameras that can point at stuff and interact with them. But is it just the controls are bad? And in some cases it feels like just the controls are bad. Like backspaces go back from a screen, which is all the way across the keyboard from every other button you <laughs> use. And the the mouse is used sometimes and not other times and like the buttons aren't hugely obvious and you get the opportunity to hold R and you go into response mode but you can only ever do that once to each thing. And if you forget something, you have the ability to like recap it, ask, ask the people you were with it or person you were with at the time, like, can you just repeat what you just said? And quite often what they say will not be necessarily pertaining to what you actually need to go to. Like there's one bit where it's like, go to the communications link, or she says, we need to go to the, the comms hub. And then there's like the link, something else it's actually called on the map. So you just have to kind of bumble your way through the space station until you find it. Yeah, I remember being a very bumbly AI and so bumbly that I actually just completely just couldn't figure out what I was meant to be doing next. The, um, yeah, asking for what to be reminded about what you need to be doing. Yeah, I found that was very, you know, it was obviously useful information for a very specific circumstance, you know, mm. a for specific kind of confusion over what I need to do. It didn't, it rarely answered my, my own uh, confusion. One thing I found out way, way, way too late, like the last thing I did in the game was that if you set a waypoint on the map, it will show up in the, the actual in-game UI as well. So I, I'd been just, you know, just floating my way around the space station, banging into the same walls because the view is very, again, I think it's deliberate in some ways and just kind of awkward in others. But the FOV is really tight because you are this this kind of like floating eyeball thing. So a well, floating eyeball would have really... Big FOV. Yeah, it's all about the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you are this, this kind of very tight, tightly viewed thing. So you bang into walls and off floating stuff and, and you got a fairly tight, obviously you're in a space station, which aren't hugely well known for uh, for being particularly wide open. And it's, it's very much the space station in the mold of the ISS, not the space station in the mold of like Prey or you know, far future stuff. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was interesting in that most of the, uh, half of the time, I think the story and, and the kind of the what, what is happening here pulled me through. And the other half of the time, I was so close to just being like, well, this is ridiculous. Like, I, this is too many rough edges on this for me to really, I'm starting to lose my sense of place in the world as being this AI. Because you, you start off being, I'm going to role play bumbling. And then by the end of it, you're just like, oh, God, I'm just terrible at this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely didn't need to role play the bumbling. I, I'm full full bumble all the time. I, I was, it's a shame because uh, I really uh, I re was really into the setup. I thought yeah. that was incredibly um, persuasively done, and the environment, like you say, it uh, it evokes the ISS rather than uh, it's like sci-fi spaceships that you're more familiar with in these sort of sci fantasy games. And for that reason, and the, the the viewpoint adds a sort of grain. The lighting on it is really, uh, really evokes those kind of the the bald flat lighting that you get in kind of in in those those sort of functional spaces, the, the hard surfaces. It it just re it's a really kind of compelling, um, compellingly real feeling environment. Mm. Um, and so I was well into it, but then, uh, like you say, the the puzzle design is just exasperating. I had to say, I I I, uh, I rage quit and uninstalled it, <laughs> like <laughs> like a fucking child. Um, <laughs> but it was it was it was, it is it's just annoying. Like there's uh, really early on, uh, it's it's not just that the puzzles are difficult to interpret; they also make mistakes of how you present and uh, help players with puzzles. So right nearly the beginning. Uh, you have to open some doors for uh, this this lady character, and uh, at one point she's like, "Okay, you got to open this door in front of me. Three, two, one." And you're like, "Whoa, what?" And it takes more than three seconds for you to navigate your camera over to the point where you could even look at the door, as far as I could tell. And it didn't seem to be anything outside it that I could interact with, which you have to mouse over and then do another thing in order to open up the interaction menu. And maybe it wasn't even on this side of the door. Maybe I had to go to uh, switch my camera view to a different room and look back at the door that she was on the other side of and find something there. In any case, I didn't do it in time. And... 
the the fail state of that wasn't oh okay you know maybe a hint as to what you're meant to do she was just like okay whatever i'm going to do it myself so i learned absolutely <laughs> nothing about my failure there and there's no way i could have improved uh, and that's just like oh you, you can't do that man <laughs> you just can't do it it's an it's an interesting like a role play thing i think because it's the idea of being like you know we, the way we inter interact with computers in the real world is that if they don't work immediately we're like oh something's broken something's wrong and that that is interesting in itself. Like if you give the player the agency of, of an AI and then, you know, if you say, AI, hey, open this door and the door doesn't immediately open, you're like, what the hell? Like what? And we, you know, we get angry at computers. There's all these studies showing that people keep swearing at Alexa and things like that because they're seen mm -hmm. as these inanimate objects. And when you do inhabit that that role, you're like, well, well why, why are you being mean to me? Like I'm trying my best kind of thing. Yeah. But it, yeah. <laughs> I don't it, want it, to fail you, not... master. Yeah, but as a player, well, a computer. yeah, exactly. Sorry. Like, it's, that's the thing. Like, as as you read, I think you're about to say, like, as as it's, it's interesting in a purely like, you know, the philosophical design side of things. But as a player, you just feel put upon, and it's kind of the opposite of that that nice AI companion that rewards you for doing stuff. It's that AI companion that is berating you. And see, they, I, I like that. I like I like the idea of that, and I I think you know I I don't remember this particular bit, but if it's framed right. That you know that that the aim, the object of that scene, isn't to teach you how to do a thing. It's to establish a certain relationship between you and the astronaut. I think that that outcome is totally legit. So this, this yeah, thing. only if it's clear to the player that that's what's being sure, achieved. Yeah, it's I all think, about it's uh, all about the frame. Otherwise, you're just baffled and and feel like you failed. Yeah. And it made me feel shit, you know, and it made me feel shit again later. Where it, uh, at one point she says. You know, you've got to give me a code for this thing. And that's how it's framed, that you are giving her something. Uh, and it pops. I'm not like, I don't know what the code is. And then it pops up with this, um, uh, like a number pad. And I'm, I'm waiting. I'm like, okay, am I meant to do something here? And then like, I haven't got hands. Seconds. I haven't got hands to push the number pad. <laughs> all I've got is binary numbers. But quite a few seconds pass. I'm like, Oh, so am I meant to just start typing numbers in and then she'll repeat them or something? So I start typing a number in and almost as soon as I do that, she starts reading out numbers to me. But obviously I've already got it wrong by this point. Um, but it's just that like, oh, I mean, that's that's what makes me feel like um, that first puzzle wasn't an intentional thing to create uh, a particular atmosphere between you and a non-player character. I think it was just a mistake because there's there's no there's no real good reason for that 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 delay in her reading stuff out when it hasn't when the point of your interaction there has not been fully explained to you uh, that there's no there's no reason for that that doesn't and that doesn't create a a richer narrative experience or it doesn't evoke any particular emotion between you and her that's just an error as far as I can tell I don't know yeah. because because do you not ever you know like you've um you 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 at you're in Windows. Um, some some program is asking you for some information. Then you get, oh, I knew it was going to ask for my address, uh, but I can't remember what this number is. So I've got to go and look it up. So you're looking it up, and the little prompt is there. And then I look, think, oh, I asked, I asked for it to pull up the prompt, and now I'm not putting anything in. I'm feeling a bit guilty. I think I'm letting down my computer. Do you not know feel like that? <laughs> Yeah, but your your computer doesn't then, in confusion, start filling in your password accidentally for you with random characters. Doesn't Maybe it, it? should. <laughs> Maybe it should. Yeah. I think yeah. There's, there's two bits in it that that I think that if the, if the puzzle design was consistent across the board, you could you know you could swing this this role playing element of it. There's one bit early on where, I, I charitably, if we are saying that you know the the countdown one is very is uh, is a design decision. There's one definitely early on where she just barks numbers at you. She's like, you know, three, four, seven, eight, three. And it's like a really long string that you won't generally, most people probably, oh, I didn't remember it anyway. Uh, so I, I ham-fistedly typed that in like three times. And then she was like, oh, for God's sake, I'll do it myself kind of thing. And that was, that felt like it was very much a, oh, you are not, you're a computer that is kind of bumbling his way through forgetting everything. Like this is, this is what you are doing. You're slowly coming back online, but you're not quite there yet. And then later in the game, again, trying not to spoil anything, but you get something where you, as a computer, suddenly have the upper hand over over a, a non-computer, and you realise that you know, okay, this is I've now t turned the tables. I've kind of built myself back up again, and that I have 
the opportunity to do something that you definitely can't do. And that kind of turnaround is really neat and really nice. But like I say, yeah, then like you guys have said before, that if, if that was as consistent all the way through and this was this kind of through wave of puzzles that, that bring you back online and teach you about the systems in the game and kind of show you show you what as a computer you can do as a powerful but half the time it's just like here is a here is a picture of a line you need to draw like snake on a nokia 3310 please remember this line and draw this line you have drawn the line you have unlocked the door well done next day mm. and it's it just feels like they're kind of you know they want to get to the next point in the story so they put in reached into the grab bag of oh, puzzles and pulled out a puzzle to do instead yeah I, I did really like i mean i think there's a couple of things that it made me go to the internet immediately afterwards and type in ending as well which is always you know not necessarily good or bad but i was just like okay i would like to know more yeah i wanted uh, to bam. know i i didn't finish it and but did want to know what happened next that was definitely powering me along as kind of things went a bit haywire and, and weird yeah i think I think it's. Uh, I think the tone is the tone is probably more than what you actually get necessarily right. all the way through the story. Uh, but yeah, I, I I did really think that in terms of because I, I think this is kind of a documented phenomenon. But in games like, God, like uh, my wife Cat played Gone Home, and she was like, "When's the jump scare? Like, I, I'm terrified. When's the jump scare?" It's like there is there isn't one. It, but the idea of being in this space alone in these kind of these spooky places does creep me out more than you know like a resident evil or some other games do and that combined with the actual leaning on the tension and leaning on the scares as well does really power this kind of just uncomfortable sensation it's dread more than anything else like there's not very many if any jump scares in the game but you just come out i came out at least feeling like oh i'm just uncomfortable now (laughs) In a good way, I should say. <laughs> like in a, it was the aim rather than I was just like. Ugh. I don't know what the studio uh, has done before or what they're what they're going to do next. Is it a British studio? Yeah, it's um yeah, it's by No Code who did also did stories untold, also oh, yeah. storytelling, very situational, in place computer and technology driven horror stories con- compendium anthology, I suppose you'd call it interesting studio you've been playing a space based game as well haven't you alex full of horrors and that's only because you were there too (laughs) we've been playing um deep rock galactic as bidden by um our lovely viewers it's good i enjoy it a lot um what is it deep rock galactic is a um cooperative first person action game i suppose um in which a party of up to four dwarves um uh are dropped into the the crust of uh um, an alien planet um and have to collect gold and shit um in their lovely um uh, uh vehicular backpack um uh to get a certain amount of stuff uh before they have to escape um all the nasty gribblies what live down there as well um and go back up to their space station and then run their fingers through their um gotten gains and also do some dancing and drinking uh and it's really fun i think did you think it was fun yeah i thought it was fun i have to say i don't have any kind of uh deeper reaction to it than, oh. well, that was a pleasant pleasant way to spend time but it was a pleasant way to spend time so i think and, um, so so we were playing with um uh tom francis as well and uh, tom and i tried a, diff- a more difficult you know a greater difficulty than we were playing as a threesome and it mm. definitely ratcheted up the pressure so the so that when you get dropped on in, into the into the underground um you're in this kind of procedural procedurally generated um a network of tunnels uh and most of the well the, actually the entire world is deformable parts of it you have quite a lot of freedom to dig through um but you're kind of limited to to a large degree in, on lots of it um but it feels very much like an area that you can kind of really dig into and muck around with and there are large caverns and there are tunnels and that kind of thing um and all the time you're being assaulted by these uh, insectoids which will come in left for dead style rushes every so often and at certain points when you get to a certain threshold of collection so if you're so if you've been asked to get 
sort of alien eggs, um, you'll get a little kind of rush of them every time you collect an egg. Um, but yeah, like we were under a lot more pressure when we put the skill level up, which was maybe a bit more fun. I think what they're aiming for is you to, to be feeling constantly under pressure, like the, and the main pressure comes from ammunition, like you, you're constantly running out of ammunition and you've got to collect a certain kind of um, material resource in order to um, get resupplies. Um, and what they really, really want is that when you've done your main collection, you uh, then have to retrace your steps generally to where you started. So it's usually coming all the way back up where you came and you're being chased by like untold numbers of um, these insectoid enemies who are spitting acid at you and, and whatever else. And I think what they really want you to be is, you know, on the brink of dying as you get to the very end and you kind of j jump into your kind of pods doors and then they slam closed and, and you breathe a sort of um, a sigh of, of relief. But we didn't really experience that when we've been playing. We got confused quite a lot, not knowing where to go, yeah. <laughs> not being able to see on the map what where we hadn't already explored. They kind of want you to be a little bit like that. and. I thought that you, Marty, you were feeling a little bit frustrated by that. I was feeling kind of like a little bit frustrated, but more kind of, oh, yeah, I feel when we solved it, yeah, we solved this thing. We're in a, a real wild world and, you know, we figured it out. But what did you... Yeah, I don't think I'd feel um, frustrated in the same way the second time. It's because I didn't know uh, what the likely solution was because it was the first time we'd encountered that problem. Mm -hmm that I was, I was frustrated when I, now that I know what to look for, which is, uh, it is, is much more obvious and, and wouldn't be frustrating in the future. I just, I, I mean, uh, I did, I did really enjoy it. <laughs> I hate to say, but, um, I have to say the thing I found most enjoyable about it was actually, uh, the tooling around this procedural, um, cave system and finding, uh, physical ways to position myself next to veins of of delicious materials yeah. and then mining them out um and being able to deform that and being able to place uh um uh, platforms and uh shoot uh zip lines yeah. across these giant cavernous spaces that was that was to me much much more fun than the combat and um yeah, agreed and although i think the combat um is probably necessary as some sort of uh uh, flip side to that that spatial exploration um i didn't i felt the way that it increased its pressure also just made it feel less kind of coherent like there were points where we were being uh, assaulted from all sides and admittedly because we were playing it perhaps not on the difficulty level that you and tom later did it wasn't necessarily a, a completely lethal situation it was just it was just chaos really and there wasn't there wasn't it didn't seem to be much way in which you could express yourself tactically or strategically after a certain point of chaos had been reached this was a, this um, was a like to explain this was a, a certain kind of mission where we had to stay within quite a tight range of a thing while it was doing a thing it doesn't matter what it was doing we just had to be near, nearby and like yeah the enemies were coming from you couldn't we we can you can often in the game kind of place yourself somewhere that is defensible and you can have some control and strat strategic um, influence over. In this case, you don't have any and enemies are coming from all directions. And like there was a point where I just couldn't even see what was going on because there was so much stuff going on. And there's this sort of yeah. kind of shieldy kind of visual effect to show that we were in the area. And that was kind of also confusing. And yeah, it was really chaotic. I mean, with um, with something comparable like Left 4 Dead, there are times when you are overwhelmed, obviously. Um, but it, it doesn't feel like you are audio-visually <laughs> just rendered insane. <laughs> Whereas the this felt just like, oh, I, I don't really know what's going on. Just, I, you know. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think that's really fair. But yeah, like um, the... The, so the, 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 the dwarves are coming four classes, I think it's four classes, and they all have quite different um, weapons, but also um, uh, movement mechanics attached to them. So I, I've been playing a gunner who has a massive minigun, so is the most, you know, the main offensive kind of um, um, uh, class. But also um, you get a zip line, which, which you can shoot out at a certain angle, which has to be reasonably flat. So you can't 
just shoot it directly in the air to get up to high points. Like you've got to be quite careful. And that's good because it makes you have to work with, for instance, the engineer who can shoot out the platform that Marty was, um, mentioned. And that, like there was some really good, you know, you have to work together. Like, like okay, now, now if you could, and you then ping a point on the, you know, on the wall, shoot another platform here. I could think I can jump up to it. Now I've zip lined up to here. And now I'm going to zip line over there. Like it's really collaborative in that way. That was definitely, yeah, you're right. That was definitely the best bit about it. The difficulty for me, I always wanted that kind of, you know, four player cooperative game. Yeah. You know, my idea of Left 4 Dead would be a lot slower and kind of shambly zombies and that tactical choice you get because it does quite often in a lot of forward mode just devolve into running backwards while shooting as many bullets as you can forwards do uh, do you think it would have that at the higher levels or does it does it kind of just devolve into the clusterfuck that you get that's definitely my fear that it does focus mostly on just putting piling on more and more pressure so you're just constantly fighting off enemies while you're trying to do the actual fun stuff yeah yeah, I didn't get a sense. I mean, this is the thing is so it's it's a game in which you unlock stuff over time. So it's it's hard to know whether at these low levels you're just not that strategically expressive because you haven't unlocked enough things. But my my sense was that you didn't go into an environment and think, "Okay, there's going to be combat here. What are the the things I can do in this particular space uh to to make the 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 battle go our way?" Um, which would be different from cave to cave. Like you would think yeah. you would have that that expressiveness because the the caves are you know the geography of the caves are quite specific and you do get to place down like sedentary turrets and things like this and obviously creating choke points is important. But really, I, I didn't find ultimately that it did allow for that kind of expressive interaction between your physical abilities and the the environment you're in ultimately it always ended up as being sort of like a, a bit of a mosh pit yeah um and most of the enemies i mean some of them have weak spo- weak points on their bums but i mean the solution to all of them is to shoot them you know i think but i wonder whether a high level like it's because the, the main pressure is actually your ammo like that that's the thing you always yeah. count so so when something has a weak point it the weak point the advantage of the weak point isn't so much for you that you can kill it faster. It's that it doesn't need so many, so much ammo. And I'm wondering yeah. whether that's the economy that you're thinking about most at the higher level. But is running out of ammunition interesting or fun? Or Because I remember when we were getting low on ammunition, we, we had some supply drops we could call in, but the sensation that we would run out of ammunition was just like, oh, that's a removal of a thing that I can do to affect this world. Mm, true. You know, it just felt like a, a lack of, of a choice rather than um, something exciting. Yeah. What do you unlock? Is it ammunition and kind of ability to get more ammunition? Or can you unlock kind of more? Is oh, there's beards. Or? There is a lot. There beards, are, you can unlock all kind of beards. There is a lot of progression stuff going on. So there's, you're, you're earning perks for, you know, achieving stuff. And these perks, kind of all these tiers of perks, which some of them seem at the lower levels fairly incidental. But they get much more powerful, kind of as you go up through the tiers of them. Ten um, percent more beard. It's like things like there was one. This is a crazy one. Um, you get a ten percent, oh no, an eight uh, percent speed boost after you've been sprinting for more than five seconds. <laughs> right? Okay, that's going to play a lot. And then uh, the second tier mm. of that was you get an eight percent speed boost when you've been running for uh, sprinting for four point five seconds. Mm. And I just thought, oh fuck that then. But there are other <laughs> ones that do things like you know, there's it's friend, there's friendly fire in this game, and you know, you get you 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 it receive. 50% less friendly fire damage and stuff like that. Like, So that's one aspect of it. There's the co- loads of cosmetics so for your clothes and beards and hair and, and goggles and stuff like that. The dwarves are, I don't know, are they wonderfully grotesque or just grotesque? I'm not sure. I definitely don't know. <laughs> I really don't like them. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think, I think that's, uh, that is probably what they were going for. They're horrible. They've just got all these disgusting fucking fat, jowly necks, chins that disappear into their neck fat. Well, this, this I mean, the... they are designed for beards because beards are the only way you can render them possibly passable as, as creatures. This is the question. Like, you realize now why all dwarves have beards. It's just that, that thing. you should never <laughs> see their chin. Their grotesque faces. Yeah, like. Soon, if anyone starts playing this, you have to um, you have to invest in a beard as soon as you can, just not to not feel sick when yeah. you're playing. 
<laughs> it's a brilliant way to tie you into to the progression system because in many games, you know, how do we get players to continue playing? How do we make them tie into the progression system? Just give them a horrible ball chin to look at, <laughs> and they'll, they'll, they'll make sure they play until they get a beard. <laughs> yeah, I put a helmet on mine as soon as I could cover that shit up. Fucking hell, the chin helmet. And then, <laughs> and then you can you can upgrade all of your equipment as well. Um, so that's th that's three areas that off the top of my head that you can upgrade like distinct areas that you that, like of resources that you're upgrading uh, there's there's so like it did def i definitely feel felt hooks um pulling into me to sort of to move my up and like i did notice that um that the weapon and equipment upgrades really did make a difference like being able to shoot the zip line um at a higher angle that was great mm. getting being able to um carry more ammunition also great I I would I'd I'd like to progress I would like to play more just to see what happens at that those really higher levels. Did it scale well to two versus three, you know, versus four potentially in the long run? Like did you feel like it was the game was fit for you, not just decrease the number of enemies or was that enough? Seemed to. Like I came in I joined you in the middle of a match and it seemed to scale okay. Would you say, Marty? Yeah, I think so. I think it does scale. I'm not quite sure whether it decreases the difficulty of the enemies. It certainly changes the number of them and the frequency of the, the hordes, I think. But I, I, don't, I don't know what else is going on under the hood. But it felt good. It felt matched to our abilities each time. Do you get traps and stuff? I really miss Orcs Must Die. I want something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have fond memories of that game. Yeah. I don't know if there are traps. There are, um, yes. I mean, there's sort of, there are, um, there's, I don't think there are any traps that you can place and the enemies will walk into them as things you can throw which then have an instantaneous effect like a you know like a grenade but it's a, a grenade which causes a force field which slows enemies as they they move into it um yeah i think it's... and, and there, there are like um mines and things you can throw down with an instantaneous um uh, you know a button you can use to detonate them but what rich said would um would fix the thing that you were talking about in terms of being able to prepare yeah. an area and that kind of thing <laughs> Well, you might do, but I mean, the the, the way that enemies uh, emerge isn't always along routes that currently exist. So, uh, some some of them will just seem to spawn up in the darkness of a of a, a giant cave and come down to you flying, and other ones will just burrow out of the ground all around you. So, True. there's only, there's not really that much you can do. Um, I think I'm, mean, yeah, I agree. It would be it would be a more interesting game if there there were more pr predictable uh, places that they would come from, and then you could. Uh, sort of trap the environment around you, or, or yeah, but uh, that, that doesn't seem to be a, that much of an option. Yeah. It's kind of give and take as well with this kind of when you have a prepared play space, you obviously you get the opportunity to, to seed it with what you want in terms of traps and that kind of thing. But if you have the procedural thing, obviously you, you do give up a certain element. Now, I've been playing, I played a, a couple of months ago, um, the World War Z, the third well, World War Z, really, but you know, the third. Uh, person like zombie horde thing it's a bit like left for dead actually very like left for dead but third person and in those you get kind of very delineated horde moments but they just have you know the traps in that they do give you traps to set but they basically just have his 18 different trap hard points that you can put one of 12 different traps in go around the area at the beginning of this wave pick up you know as many traps as you can in that time put down as many as you can in that time and they will go off there's no real like consideration of oh have i done anything skillful here it's just have i picked it up and then put it back down again in the right place and it's fun seeing you know hordes of zombies kind of pressed against an electrified fence it sounds weird saying that out loud but um <laughs> that's quite yeah from from the you can line all them all up and shoot them all in one go over there and that's quite fun but you do lose something in the fact that fights become just an element of precision how much can you whittle down each time rather than any kind of of the, of the niceness you get with more organic fights, it sounds like, in Deep Rock Galactic. Hey, 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 lads. Should we do some questions from questions? Sounds like a good idea. Sounds yeah. like the kind of thing we would do. Okay. Do you have any? Because I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Dan from Brisbane writes, Dear cock and balls, I recently started playing robot shooty bang game Generation Zero and found a rather interesting immersion breaker. The game supposes that you've been on a camping trip and have returned to a world devoid of humans that has been taken over by roaming robots. While exploring the game, it tries to do a Bethesda and do some environmental storytelling, 
uh, with discovering arranged corpses and destroyed robots or rebel encampments, etc., etc. I keep finding campsites with campfires and food on them or cars with their headlights on, employing some amount of rapid shock and awe tactics by the robots, taking, say, one to two days. I also am finding ad hoc rebel encampments that have been constructed out of scrap and burnt out rusty cars, implying a longer drawn out battle, say two weeks to a month. These conflicting datums, did, oh, maybe he means dates. Dates? Datas? Data. I don't know. These conflict. Con- these conflictions, let's say, uh, stand independent of each other geographically, but it's made getting into the admittedly scant story that much harder. Have you ever encountered such examples of narrative narrative dissonance? Gracias por imitar esos pods. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one because uh, yeah, I thought the same in um, in uh, 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 Generation Zero. There's a so that, I think the idea is that yeah, you've come back from a, a, a fishing trip so yeah it's obviously happened or like yeah a canting trip so that's you can't have been away for more than you know, a week or something but um i think they subsequently then discover that people have kind of been collected together and and tried to shelter against the robot bad guys and so therefore that could explain why there are cars that have been recently abandoned because their lights are still on to a degree but it does feel really messy because you don't, yeah, it doesn't really make much sense. Yeah. This, uh, I mean, his, his Bethesda comparison is interesting because Bethesda are uh, absolute criminals for this sort of inconsistency. <laughs> um, like, I mean, the, the, the thing that we always bring up when we talk, Alex, is, is about how nobody seems to have made their beds in the, you know, 100 years <laughs> since uh, the nuclear disaster happened. Everybody's just living with, you know, like, cabinets of rotting shit next to them and stuff like this. And nobody seems to have swept out their uh, their sleeping chambers or anything like this. Three dogs. Which is mad. What a maniac. Podcasting. Yeah. You, you know, as we all know, we all podcast from a very, you know, comfortable, neat space. He's been podcasting on his radio station next to a load of fucking bins for, for <laughs> yeah. years now. I what a just, uh, Put away all my rotten food in the cupboard next to me. <laughs> I remember I, I got really angry also with, uh, so this is in Fallout 4, like to close to the start of the game, you stumble on this diner. And this is like, it's a diner that's that, that, that people are living in, I think. And there are all these just skeletons at the, the booths. <laughs> Man, who needs to get rid of the creepy skeletons? Like, just leave them there in our house. Adds to the ambiance. And all, all, those, uh, all those cavern complexes in every game, including the Tomb Raiders, etc., which have uh, recently lit torches on the walls. <laughs> like, who's going around? Who's the lamplighter for, you know, fucking dungeons? <laughs> Long abandoned dungeons. There's that the whole question of animal ecosystems and those kind of things as well. Like, you know, how was there apart from a T Rex in Tomb Raider two? But like, how was What's it living on? Stuff? Yeah, yeah. Who's like that, that's it... a lot of biomatter that that um, that animals having to to eat. You know, to stay alive. Unless you kind of build your own narrative and just say it's you know it's parallel universes where every day a new Tomb Raider appears and pre- all previous ones have been eaten, <laughs> providing sustenance. <laughs> I think yeah, for, for me it's definitely the Bethesdas of the world because they, I think. It's simp- it's it's an impossible complaint that you make this living breathing. You know, that's such a back of the box quote thing, but like <laughs> in inverted commas, living breathing world, and you're always going to fall short. You can never hit it quite, but it's just you know you have these people that go around their day to day lives. I always remember in Oblivion, I couldn't work out whether it was ever poignant or if it was just shit. But like City Swimmer was one of the uh, Argonians in Bravo, oh, yeah. yeah. and she died on the steps of a of the pub. And she had a, a bit of stolen bread on her. And I was like, wow, isn't that, that's amazing to show that even in this that's world, poignant. inequality exists. And then everyone was just stepping over her to get to the pub. And I was like, you'd probably clean the body up, right? Surely. <laughs> and she was left there for the rest of my game, just like this <laughs> dead on the floor. It's, like, it's gone from being a bit poignant to just being a bit shit now. So, the thing, the difference is like with Tomb Raider, like Tomb Raider isn't inviting you to look closely at the, at the sconces and wonder the story, the deep narrative behind the sconce. Whereas... If only we could talk to the sconces, Alex. <laughs> Whereas, like Bethesda, like it does want you to think about these little tableau that that the the, 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 the kind of the environment designers have, have put together. And unfortunately, there is there is some meaning, but some of the meaning is bad meaning. <laughs> I think it's amazing when 
uh, like the, um, talking about the the no clip arcane documentary um the one bit i did see pulled out on twitter was the talking about scripting and saying that if you could you know if you uh, get to the beginning of dishonored and kill Dowd before he kills the empress it the game would just kind of finish itself it'd be like oh i guess you're done which is obviously some quirk of, of the scripting that they had behind the scenes but that that kind of thing you know games like deus ex do this do this well where they they do extrapolate that narrative narrative dissonance like if you do do something that is out of the normal realms of possibility or what the designer or whoever it was was originally planning it counters you doing it and kind of reacts to you doing it and that's when it feels amazing yeah so mm. those kind of stick in the craw a bit more potentially than than some other stuff that's just like you know uncharted obviously not a pc game but uncharted was always terrible for this where you are this this wisecracking like indiana jones type who just murders yeah, body counts in the tens like thousands probably by the end of the game and it's just endless streams of these these identikit bad guys and <laughs> yeah it's meant to be this kind of knockabout thing but by the end of it you're just like oh my god how many yeah. have i killed i think the other thing with um the bethesda style thing like especially with fallout um is that actually a lot of the, the environmental storytelling is telling one story and that story is god the things we have lost. God, look, look out of your own window and, and see all these things. Isn't isn't our existence gossamer thin? And like, you sort of think, yeah, 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 yeah. We could all die. Uh, they could be an <laughs> And that is the same story from the start of the, like as soon as you exit into the kind of like into the wasteland from until the end of the game. And there is, it's one thing like, yep, you've done it at the start, but it's, told over and over again somebody might, <laughs> somebody might come along and steal all your dinosaur skeletons <laughs> yeah collect all of our skulls and pile them in a in a cupboard somewhere and carry on podcasting <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one guy who likes cannon brawl writes an email unsurprisingly about cannon brawl dear cnc cannon brawl is the one game I'd consider myself good at. A game no one else seemed to have heard of or played. I've sunk countless hours into it and gone to the point where I'm good, too good to play anyone, anyone new, but the servers are a veritable ghost town. There's no one else for my friends to practice against, leaving me really skilled at a game no one plays. I was wondering if any of you had had this problem, being really good at something that no one else wants to play. Thanks, that one guy who likes Cannon Brawl. I've never heard of Cannon Brawl. Yeah, no. I'm not sure I know what it is. You're right, yeah. the poor guy. <laughs> I've been really bad at games people don't want to play. Yeah, that's. I I would say the my answer to this is no, but that's only because I'm really bad at all the games. The, I guess when I back in the the PC gamer days, what ten odd years ago now, uh, I used to play a lot of Nidhog with Owen. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, Owen Hill. Uh, Sorry, Owen Jones now, a uh, friend of podcast, uh, who, yeah, we got, I guess, quite good, but it was always hard to tell because I don't think it was online at that point. Back, that was back when it was still just a local thing. But I remember no one else would play us on the team for a bit because we would just be hunched over the keyboard. I remember he invented a, a move called the Wildebeest, which he uh, would crouch and then oh, yeah. back up repeatedly and while shouting, it's the Wildebeest over and over again. It's partly a mind game. <laughs> yeah, it definitely worked. Um, I always maintain that the the one game that Bill and Ted style, were I to to have to battle death for my soul in some kind of some kind of game, would be uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Three, I think. <laughs> and I did get to I think my greatest ever gaming accolade. I got to as eleventh place in the world leaderboards on Tony Hawk's Project Eight on one of the score attack challenges like halfway through the game. <laughs> but no one else really played them by that point. Because that was like the what, the, the ninth game, eleventh game in, in that series. And by that point everyone else had kind of checked out. But it, have you gone back to see where your position is now? Oh you no, should. I think it lasted like three days, but I, I took you know, <laughs> an old uh, Nokia phone picture of it from my TV, my VGA TV at the time. I was very proud of myself for it for a while, but I think that's the best I've ever done in the game. I think I've been good at games um, before matchmaking was <laughs> was a thing. So I like um, I was very good at uh, Gears of War One's multiplayer. 
in comparison to other random people who I'd encounter playing a game. Like maybe if there was matchmaking, I would find that I wouldn't rise up the ranks. But you know, in comparison to the average, uh, I was I was really good at it. Nobody wanted to play it with me. And also the same with um, un- one of the Uncharted's had multiplayer, which was oh, yeah. excellent. Or at least I was much better at it than the average player. Um, <laughs> And uh, which made me feel really good, but that doesn't really happen with other games. I think it's because both of them weren't really Twitch-based shooters. There was more, um, uh, a lot more about positioning uh, in both of those those games. And so my my uh, sluggish synapses weren't so much of a uh, a, a problem for me. Do you either, either of you play those? No. The uh, I played some of the Last of Us multiplayer, which was surprising again, surprisingly good. There's that kind of weird genre of games that have surprisingly good multiplayer is mass effect 3 being in there as well just games mm. that you expect not to have decent multiplayers and actually have a surprisingly good system but i guess it's the the issue as well with if you play with friends who you're not dragging along with you along the way to your ascent to the mountaintop then you are kind of losing people along the way by default and you have to find a new set of people to play with you remember playing yeah. playing dota 2 with uh with chris chris Thurston and a few other friends as well and that was kind of an exercise in just watching people. You know, we played for a long time together as a fivesome, and then a fivesome became a foursome, and then a foursome became a threesome, and then it was, you know, down to occasionally when people would have time to play. And then I think Chris played a bit longer than I did, but I think we all steadily realized that we just weren't having fun anymore because you go from being like enjoying yourself and learning new stuff to just knowing what it is you're doing wrong and not being able to correct it necessarily. But I guess that's probably also not to the same level as the question asker who sounds to actually be genuinely good rather than just vaguely competent at one point. Claymore uh, writes in to say, Dear Yarls and Throthgars, Chris's malfunction upon saying his own name at the end of the last podcast made him sound vaguely Scandinavian to my ears. That made me think of Norseman, a quite funny and very silly TV show. If you haven't heard about it, it's a Norwegian-produced parody of Vikings, and each scene was filmed first in Norwegian and then in English with fabulous Norwegian accents, a trailer for reference, uh, which we will include in the show notes. So my question, would you rather play Ascreed Valhalla in Old Norse and English or in accented English? More generally, does every dwarf have to be Scottish? Does every Roman have to be a p- posh and British? And accents and games, do they work? Thanks again for the pods and for regularly making me laugh out loud while jogging to the bemusement of passers-by. Claymore. <laughs> well, to answer the question, like the first question anyway, and obviously you're Old or- Norse for sure. Right? That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. It'd be fun just to hear it. Yeah, that'd be lovely. I think um, so. the the kind of stereotype um, accents. So with, with the Roman, sort of posh English Roman voice, do you think that came from the kind of uh, the, the, what are they called? The swords and sandals or toga? You know, like the sort of 1950s Roman films, big Roman Hollywood films. Is that where they came from? Because they would give British actors with gravitas sort of thing, these kind of... Is it, yeah. Evil is it not roles. because the Romans generally the baddies and the British people are always the baddies? But where did that, where did that get set up? Like it must... I get we the feeling the it's a Hollywood thing. Yeah, but apart from being the baddies. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard. I wonder... I mean, I haven't really spoken to uh, any Italians about this, but I wonder how they feel about... Uh, uh, their ancestors being portrayed almost exclusively with posh British accents <laughs> elsewhere <laughs> in the world. It's a very strange. It's a very strange thing. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, dwarves do tend to have uh, expressively regional accents, which is I don't know what I don't know what's meant to be conveyed by that, but it it feels like it might be an insult. Because it's funny because dwarves in like in general dwarf the dwarf thing is that they're you know they're very aristocratic long families kind of lots of honor going on in them you know like that seems to go against the stereotype of um what regional kind of peoples would be like because the other stereotype of what a scottish or general reaction ones is is salt well i suppose it's a salt of the earth thing in the fact that they're kind of miners and things but that that they would be more working class but like yeah most most dwarf kind of stories are about like these rulers, really, aren't they? I mean, certainly it's in quite, stuff like Lord of the Rings. That's quite a, a diplomatic version, I guess, of reading of what dwarf dwarf kind of fantasy culture is, I guess. Because yeah, the 
I think the three adjectives I was thinking in my head were lives in the mountains, ginger, and hairy. <laughs> and those, yeah. I, I guess arguably do kind of come with some of the less charitable Scottish stereotypes. Well, there's drinking as well, right? Yeah. And Which is uh, belligerent. A bit of a... Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, in general though, I mean, having the the choice of whether you go with the original accent or you go with something in English with an, uh, sorry, if you go with the original language or you go with something in English with an accent, I, I think there's something weird about the choice of doing things in accented English altogether. Like I, uh, people were quite um, sneery about um, the Chernobyl TV series, which mm. um, is obviously set in Russia uh, and uh, uh, or Ukraine. But um, had people speaking English in English accents, and that that to me seems far more plausible uh, and and meaningful to me as a viewer, as an English speaking viewer, than if they were trying to put on Russian accents. Because one thing that comes across in in their attempt to translate it um, is that you you pick up on things like class and uh, and region and. Um, in ways which you wouldn't if everybody was trying to do a, a fake Russian accent. Yeah, I wonder um, whether that, that seems. Sorry, sorry. I was going to say, I wonder whether the like the you get this innate like British ability to yeah like distinct like to work out where people fit in those you know class and, and weigh so heavy on the the British psyche that the accent does mean a lot more yeah. i think mm. maybe than it does for for maybe for other countries or american or you know other english-speaking viewers potentially because i always wonder whether anybody else understands it outside of the uk because like yeah. there are those nintendo um kind of cartoonish games or that's not a nintendo game actually um oh, what's it called so sort of a uh, studio ghibli was involved with it and it's um Oh, the one with yeah, the, I know that you know yeah, I mean. yeah. Like, it's got drippy. That's right. Drippy, Drip, drippy the the Welsh snot nosed goblin elf thing. And um uh and like yeah, I wondered whether anybody but British people would pick up on the yeah, those meanings you talk Nino Cooney. Nino Cooney. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, the like Treehouse, the Nintendo in house kind of uh, internal uh, localization team, they're amazing at this and kind of getting the working out, you know, the regional kind of things like the, the example with animal crossing that everyone keeps talking about at the moment you know the the fact that in um the reason the turnips are the stock exchange so you, you buy turnips and then you sell turnips like turnips that work like shares which is the, the stalk market s-t-a-l-k yeah. in english but in japanese kabu is uh is turnip but it's also shares stocks and shares oh, so like kabushi so is like is a is like a publicly traded company that so, is a beautiful bit of translation business. So that that's a kind of that's a really and there's there's loads of these like, off the top of my head. Like, I'm sure I can dig some out, but like they they do a really neat job in in working out those kind of puns, and it works perfectly for kind of Nintendo stuff because you do have that that bridge and that kind of that playful gap. Speaking of Japanese, I, I played um, Sekiro in Japanese with an eye to bolstering any kind of nascent language ability I've got after seven years here, which is still terrible, but. <laughs> It, it's the same kind of problem I had when I played Yakuza in Japanese in that you, you can learn Japanese by doing it, but it's not anything close to the Japanese you'll actually hear in Japan anymore because it's very much a, you know, Sengoku Jido, like the, the Warring States period, 1600s kind of era. It's like if you were to learn English by a gritty retelling of Shakespeare where everyone's talking in these and thous and honorific language and mm. stuff like that. So it was interesting when I watched the English translations of, of Sekiro where everyone was being very, very kind of anime-esque, hyperbolic and big sweeping actorly statements and things like that. So I was like, actually, this does kind of fit because hmm. everybody is being as, as OTT and as, you know, for Japanese listeners, they will realize that this person is way overly, you know, either denigrating you or being overly humble to their master or whatever in, in the language choice they use that is as kind of jarring and archaic as a lot of the the has done this you know that we get in in the the cod shakespeare stuff in english as well so it kind of it kind of did fit i thought and i thought it was mm. quite a neat way of doing it but i guess if you're only coming from from the english side it might come off as cheesy and a bit awkward yeah so, yeah there's um uh there's a series in which it didn't work 
uh, just being reproduced in English. So, uh, so when the big Scandi uh, crime drama thing really hit, uh, you got this ad adaptation of uh, Verlander uh, in English uh, with Kenneth Branagh uh, as the lead character. Uh, except in English, it was called Wallander. Um, and um, although all the names were Scandinavian, it was set in Scand Scandinavia, um, in Sweden rather. Um, he spoke in English, uh, unaccented English. Uh, or you know his own accent, I guess, and other people spoke in in English straight up without any kind of accent, um, and people seemed to sort of buy that. There was a slight kind of dissonance, but I, I think because maybe the uh, the environment of of Sweden at a glimpse isn't totally alien from things that you would see in the UK. Uh, uh, I think pe people sort of bought it. But then um, they produced a TV series. They, I don't know, uh, the BBC, I guess, put on TV series called Zen, uh, which was uh, shot in Italy. Um, and obviously, it meant to be Italian characters, um, but they were all English actors, like Rufus Sewell's in it. And there's just something really strikingly weird about, you know, this you know beautiful sun-drenched landscapes and all these incredibly well-dressed, tanned, beautiful humans uh, looking incredibly Italian, as Italian as you can get, climbing off Vespers at every opportunity. <laughs> and then as soon as they open their mouths, it's like, all right, mate, yeah, oh, mom, we've got to go down. And it's like, what the f What? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Your brain immediately sort of recoils at it. But uh, yeah. Like Chernobyl and Death of Stalin as well. There was the other one that kind of did it really well. Like it leans into it. Mm. It, it yeah. doesn't just if you if you kind of unremark it. If if you don't mention or you don't kind of lean into the idea that you know in Death of Stalin the fact that that Stalin is kind of has this kind of Cockney thing. So you you need to kind of lean into the idea of him. You know where he he's located in in the the Russian kind of diaspora there, and. You can get there's a thing around Twitter the other day. Jason Isaac's doing the kind of the northern Zhukov, Marshall Zhukov uh, yeah. thing. Mm. Where he he was doing, you know, you can you can place him and you kind of get the idea that he is this sort of the Earth character who who can have a, little yeah. bit, a bit of bants with people and that kind of thing. And that, but there's that, also something about saying like, I mean, you just saying Zhukov there that doesn't sound that doesn't sound weird. Like saying Russian names badly, probably with an English accent. Doesn't sound as, as strikingly weird as as you know. It was like, all right, Francesca Mourinho. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like... <laughs> maybe you should uh, you should watch more Premiership coverage because there's a lot of a lot of that going around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. I was just said, going back to the original question. After that discussion, I wonder whether I I, I might revise my opinion that that I'd like to hear it in Old Norse because because um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So I played as are uh, the 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 woman one i can't remember what they called this alexis is the male cassandra. cassandra yeah um i played as cassandra and um and she speaks in a kind of light accented english language and that feels very right it just feels right that that she sounds like that that's her that's just mm. and i don't know i i suppose it's all framing isn't it and kind of in that case, I think everyone has this sort of vaguely kind of Greekiness to their voices, and so the idiom is is modern. Yeah, uh, I think that's and I'm mm. you know I'd I would rather, and this, I mean this is pointlessly nerdy really for something which involves fighting the Pope etc. But um, <laughs> <laughs> fighting your space Pope, but we I mean the the the, th the kinds of things you could can say are constrained by the language that you have available to you somebody uh, there there isn't an equivalent a lot of the time for for slang modern slang in old english i think you know you get this in a lot of the localization stuff like japanese being my, my obviously day-to-day -day experience but swearing doesn't really exist so you you see quite a lot of you know fuck and shit is used in you know you have kids stores i, I was shopping for nappies like prior to lockdown and they were playing i think it's a little john song and it's just like rampantly swearing in a child's shop and it wasn't <laughs> kind of seen to be it's just a word it doesn't have the kind of the baggage that it does in english and you can explain it but it just doesn't really kind of work in the same way it just the, the language doesn't have that sense of this word is bad and if you say it it's bad and even you know the, the kind of the more southern european approaches where it's insulting mothers and that kind of thing or whatever it is to to get your point across rather than a word in particular that doesn't also really do much here so you you have to 
yeah, there's a lot of a lot of shops have had things where there's one in Osaka a couple of years ago where it's like great big fucking sale that they had on for Christmas along <laughs> all the shop fronts and everything. And someone had to go in and quietly explain to them why it wasn't okay to have this in giant letters. I don't know. I think I'm definitely behind that. <laughs> but just extrapolating that out though, if would you say that therefore that if um Assassin's Creed or um Valhalla was in old Norse, right? Would that restrict what people what you know the your subtitle subtitles you're actually reading to go through restrict what you're getting to hear because because you would hope that that old norse was kind of like deeply researched and they're saying proper kind of insults and proper kind of um you know kind of just proper stuff which doesn't wouldn't translate as we've been talking about to english very naturally and therefore actually the the vocal range of it all would actually collapse a little bit and therefore if we want an interesting kind of script um filled with um sort of meaningful to us um storylines and and kind of positions and and language you should just put it in english to start with yeah, maybe that's true. I mean, that's I mean that's sort of what they do with Deadwood, right? Which is obviously in English originally, but I mean they uh, they use a more modern yeah yeah people didn't got, swear people did not swear people, back then. But the things that they said were as bad to them as swearing mm. would be exactly. to us, and yeah, so yeah. they've they've they. But I, I think you, I mean Deadwood is one of the best written things uh, in existence. So I mean it's it's hard to compare. Or, or suggest other people take that route because they might not have the same delicacy, um, and it might might uh, might fall flat. But um, yeah, I see what your point. I don't know. Yeah, I, it'd be hard if you translated things directly from. Uh, I mean, this is this is why it's quite hard to read uh, a lot of epic old poems in translation, is because if you translate it directly, then you you remove a lot of the. Uh, the connotations that would have been apparent to the audience at the time, which would have imbued it with more subtlety and emotion because a simple translation is to a, an audience, which doesn't have those same linguistic reference points will just, would just feel dead a lot of the time. Hmm. It's interesting as well that it's Assassin's Creed, given that, you know, Assassin's Creed 2 had Ezio, who was basically just Mario who could stab people. <laughs> the, guy, the, the kind of the light touch and the amount of research that you'd, you'd expect from this kind of thing, you know, that, doesn't seem based on, on previous track records that they would they lean into that too much. Although it does oh, ask the question of, I love of, Ezio. He was great. He was great, but he's very yeah, there's very much that kind of he's written in English, but he has a fun Italian accent at the end of it. It's like <laughs> if you want Mario in the original Italian, I always wonder what he sounds like in Italian. Or like whether everyone's like, ooh, a bit awkward. <laughs> Aiden writes in to say, Hi, night elves in World of Warcraft sometimes did a flip when you jumped. I loved that flip. What's your favourite jump in a game? P.S. Last episode, in response to talk of Alex's decaying body, Chris said, You're just going to hear a bong and the phrase humanity restored will appear. Rather than the dulcet ring of a bell, I imagined a bubbling noise, and this made me laugh. <laughs> That's what I hear too, all the time. <laughs> Yeah, you need to uh, take some Rennie, mate. That's all you're at. <laughs> jumps in a game? Favourite jumps? Mario's long jump, mate. Eh, that's a good one. I was going to go for Princess Peach. Oh, what? In Mario in, 2? In, uh, Super, yeah, Super Mario Brothers 2. Mm. It's basically a cheat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Allows you to hover indefinitely. Well, not indefinitely, for a, a number of seconds, which makes a lot of the, the platforming uh, much more trivial. Root. Yeah, I always remember finding the, uh, I say finding, I've been told by people on the schoolyard, like in, uh, is it Tomb Raider 1 or 2 where you could do the swan dive? Oh, yeah. That being that being a thing. And also if you pressed end when you did the jumping forward, you'd like flip in midair and land backwards. I remember that being amazing as well. But I guess. It, yeah, was, I mean, the, it was the amount of setup that was required and all the kind yeah. of like, like, go forward one step and now turn 90 degrees. It's the and octopus then, hands oh, you need God, for the keyboard as well. Yeah. <laughs> the example that people always use for like the the idea of giving you something to do while moving around that's not necessarily like you know mm. jumping obviously to get up a ledge or down a ledge or whatever but just giving you something to do across the the, the middle of the stage is uh, in ocarina of time the role yeah saying so that rarely existed in the game for any purpose other than to give you something to push while going across the uh 
the middle the Hyrule field in the middle of the the world yeah you kind of no, felt oh i'm going faster but actually all, all mm. you were doing was giving yourself something to do so it felt fast there's loads of interesting psychology behind that kind yeah. Of thing. yeah alex didn't you write about that at some point oh i don't know maybe <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> It's probably a double jump, isn't there? I was thinking um, Metroid Prime. That was a good double jump. Uh, Jedi Knight 2 had a good jump. What kind the of a jump, jump did it have? I never played it. It's the force jump where you could go. It was, it was two, I think. One was in first person, and obviously two, you could go, and three, you could go third as well. But yeah, having that force power where you kind of like, I'm jumping, and then, oh, I'm still jumping. And you just kind of keep hovering up. <laughs> kind of Jedi benefit. <laughs> it's that kind of game where it felt like you were obviously probably most of the time. I mean, that era probably weren't actually most of the time, but you felt like you were breaking the the limits of the game a little bit. Actually, like, yeah, it is the ones that make you feel like you're cheating a little bit. Like as you're saying, Marty, with um with Princess Peach, I was thinking about there's a there's this particular move in Celeste, and I it's a lo- another long jump star move, but you can massively you can get much more. Um, distance with a certain kind of technique which is quite difficult to pull off but once you know how to do it it becomes quite an important part of your move set but it does feel because it's not documented and it's never taught to you um, and then it just just it just emerges from the mechanics of, of the way that jumps work and inputs are taken it feels like you have hacked a game like that you've kind of broken it that that you're cheating a little bit but it's still kill skill based but i can't remember exactly how you put it off but it's yeah that those kind of things are the often the best kind of movement mechanics do like a ground pound oh yeah yeah is it a mario game where he sort of does a flip uh sort of rotates 360 in the air and then plummets straight down i think yoshi does that does that as well. oh does he yeah yeah, Max 64, he does the kind of the, if you fell off something really a long way and did that just before the ground, you wouldn't take any fall damage either. Just yeah. a nice, yeah. nice little thing. Um, Mirror's Edge obviously had a nice kind of, it's the only game really that kind of got the feeling of actually, well, not actually jumping, but close to the idea of, right, there's a physicality to this. I'm chucking myself off something and I'm going to hit the floor or I'm going to not, or I'm going to hit the floor a long, a long time later. Uh, and hitting like a, a wall run. I think most wall runs in games feel good as well. Uh, the latest, what's that? I always forget what it's called. The new Star Wars game, Jedi. Jedi friend. Jedi friend. Jedi shitty robot companion. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> Jedi thingy. Uh, that the wall runs. Fallen order. Fallen Fall order. There we go. <laughs> Memorable, eh? <laughs> That felt the wall runs and that felt nice, but I think it's just that idea of like defying defying gravity without the songs. Um, feels good. Well, those are all the questions that we had. Uh, if you'd like to send us a question, you can do so at questions at Creating Crowbar or you can tweet us at Creating Crowbar. All these recordings are uploaded as videos to YouTube uh, where you can find other bullshit by us. Uh, the address for that is youtube.com slash Creating Crowbar. Thanks as always to our backers on Patreon. You can back us too. If you wish, at patreon.com slash Creighton Crowbar, or you can simply join our incredibly lovely Discord community, at the link for which is on our website, which is creightoncrowbar.com. That's it. I've been Marsh Davis. I've been Alex Wiltshire. And I've been Rich McCormick. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> and <laughs> thanks, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye. <laughs>